so thank you for uh, for accepting me. Um, so I work in the developer technology group at NVIDIA, which means I get to work directly with uh, developers, um, try to get the most out of our uh, out of our platform. And on top of that, since January, I've been the uh, the chair of the OpenACC Technical Committee. Um, I was joined in preparing this talk by Dr. Michael Wolf, who is a compiler engineer uh, at NVIDIA, and I. I uh, since he's uh, not the one speaking, I can I can brag and say that he you know he literally is the guy who wrote the book on on uh, parallel compilers, and he also was the uh, the previous chair of the of the technical committee. I can get my slides to advance here. There we go. So I know uh, you know, Will Sawyer spoke yesterday about OpenACC, but some of you may not be totally familiar with uh, with what we do. Uh, OpenACC is a directive based parallel programming model. Um, some people uh, would try to frame it as a GPU programming model, but it, it truly isn't. Uh, we aim to, to work on any parallel platform. Um, it just happens that we, uh, that this, uh, these set of directives were designed uh, during a time period where GPUs were kind of up and coming, and so it was certainly designed for highly parallel processors such as GPUs and FPGAs. Um, three of the top five HPC applications in the world, according to Intersect 360 Research, and that's uh, VASP, Gaussian, and um, I'm blanking on the other one, Ansys Fluent, are open ACC applications. And about a fifth of the time on the Summit supercomputer, which until last week was the fastest computer in the world, um, about a fifth of their allocated time runs open ACC code. So we've seen a lot of growth in both adoption in both applications and in terms of um, Slack uh, developers that, are, that we know of. Um, this slide, I admit, is a bit of an eyesore, and I don't expect you to read each of these quotes. Uh, my favorite is the one from uh, the, the head developer of Gaussian, who commented that uh, by using OpenACC, they can just worry about developing their fundamental algorithms and, uh, and worry about the parallel and the GPU parts, um, uh, take that off the table, and simply worry about developing their algorithms. And Gaussian, um, by many measures, is, is likely the most used Fortran application in the world. Um, I also want to point out MPAS A. Uh, this is a code that's used by uh, the weather company in their short-term weather forecast. So um, if you're still using the default weather provider on your cell phone, chances are you're getting your, uh, your next three days worth of forecasts from an open ACC code. So that's really uh, has seen a widespread adoption. And of course, as I said, um, uh, Will was nice enough to, uh, to present something on ICON yesterday. And we are an industry standard. Um, we have a good mix of hardware and software vendors in um, national labs in the US and in, in other countries, and then also universities. So we've got quite a, a wide mix of contributors. Now, here's uh, the highest level introduction I can give you on what OpenACC looks like. Um, it is, uh, being a directive, it is basically a comment in, in Fortran, and the syntax is bang dollar sign ACC. Um, we have directives for kicking off parallel execution, so I tell the compiler this is the part of my code that I want to run in parallel, so here I'm showing the ACC parallel directive for that. Uh, we have directives for optimizing the how your loops get mapped to that parallelism. That's uh, what I show here with the ACC loop directive. And then we have some for managing data movement. And all of these are going to actually turn out to be pretty important later in this talk. But what we strive for is being a, a directive-based model that you can maintain a single source code and just incrementally uh, move more of your application to, to be parallel. And I like to say that directive-based programming in general is very Omdahl friendly because rather than spending six months rewriting a, a particular portion of my code, I can incrementally add things to the code and get more code running in parallel faster. Now, what is my view of uh, directives for parallel programming and, and their uh, kind of the way they fit into the world? Now, I should point out that directives themselves are simply a way to convey additional information to the compiler. And there's uh, a variety of directives that are outside of the scope of my talk. Uh, here, I specifically want to talk about parallel programming directives like OpenACC. 
And they uh, were really designed during a time period where all of the major programming languages, and we support C, C++, and Fortran, um, although I'm going to reach out to Melissa here a little bit later because I, had, I have been working on some bindings to get them working with, uh, with Python unofficially. Uh, but take these serial programming languages we have and bridge the gap until we have parallel programming languages. And arguably now um, at this point in time, uh, C++ and Fortran have become parallel languages. And so there's a question of, okay, well, where do directives still fit in this world? And are there still gaps that we need to fill? Or can we just say, mission accomplished, we're done? And so I want to visit some of those topics here. Um, when parallel programming, there's really five concerns that, uh, that the, the program needs to think about. The first one is expressing the parallelism in their code. You know, what can and should be run in parallel? And um, I'm primarily going to be focusing on data parallelism, on, on rich loops that can be run in parallel. Uh, and once you've expressed that parallelism, uh, you may have need to optimize that parallelism. So uh, we aim to abstract away the parallelism at a high enough level that you can compile for a GPU or multi-core CPU or an FPGA or some other platform. But if I know which platform I'm going to be running on, sometimes I can do better to really optimize for that specific um, platform. Next is managing locality. And I'm, I split up compute locality and data locality. So many modern machines, uh, such as Summit, where I spend a lot of my time, are heterogeneous machines. So I have, I begin executing on a CPU, but I need, may need to spawn some of my work to additional CPU cores, or even spawn it to, uh, to GPUs. And I need to be able to control where my work lands. And um, that, that's a, a key part in, uh, in managing these more complex, uh, very rich systems. And if I'm managing where my code runs, well, I need to manage where my data resides because it's always going to run faster if my code executes close to the data. And lastly, uh, managing asynchronous operations. So as uh, high performance computers have gotten really more complex, there's a lot more um, parts to them. Uh, sometimes you, you need to be able to launch work asynchronously uh, so that you can occupy all of the different parts, whether it's multiple GPUs, it may be the PCI Express bus, uh, it may be different CPU cores, and being able to have all of the parts busy at once to get maximum uh, utilization. So these are the five concerns that I want to talk about how Fortran and OpenACC have addressed these. So starting with OpenACC, uh, how do we express parallelism? And so I have a very simple vector addition on the left. I'm going to have this on the next several slides. Um, so in OpenACC, I would say ACC parallel, or you may also see some people write ACC kernels. There's a, a subtle difference between the two of those that is really outside of the scope of this talk. But I'm spawning parallelism, and then I'm telling the compiler what loop can be run there. So uh, this ACC loop, uh, there's this extra clause of independent. I'm in informing the compiler that uh, the iterations of this loop are independent and therefore can be run in any order, including concurrently. So um, that assertion is really important to a compiler that wants to generate parallel code. So I've inserted what can be run in parallel uh, with this loop directive. And also I've kind of given a pretty strong hint of what should be run in parallel by, by instructing the compiler, here is a region of code where there, I want you to run. Uh, and actually, I'm missing an end parallel direct, uh, directive here. There's a, a mistake in the slide. Now, some things I haven't shown here, there is a private clause, there is a reduction clause, and there are uh, uh, atomics available. And that's really for identifying what are my parallelism blockers. You know, this loop may be completely independent provided I respect this reduction, for instance. And so uh, that uh, turns out to be a very important thing. And it's, um, as I've talked to uh, Fortran developers about, OK, what would it take to stop using directives and, and use just standard Fortran? Well, one of the things they pointed out is reduction, which I know um, was uh, Steve Lionel talked about yesterday, is, is a feature that is coming in the language. So here is how someone might write native Fortran 2018, or even really anything here um, that I show on this slide is, is Fortran 2008 valid as well. Uh, I can use a do concurrent. And for this loop, it's 
quite simple. There's, uh, again, every iteration loop is independent of each other. I've declared to the compiler that they can be run in any order. And so there's a pretty good representation here of uh, what is available for parallelism. And there's other ways to express this in Fortran. I have below that the array syntax version, which likewise um, would give a pretty strong indication to the compiler that this can be parallelized. And then there's other intrinsics as well. So if I want to do a matrix multiplication, well, that is something that's pretty well understood how to parallelize a matrix multiplication. So if I simply call matmul, a compiler might choose to parallelize that. So, um, so I, once again, I have some ability here baked into the Fortran language to do this expression of parallelism. I can identify the privatization of variables if necessary. There's currently no loop level reduction, although we know that's, uh, that's intended to come in the next version. And there's no loop level atomics either. Um, and I think the reduction is really the more, the more important of the two. That having that um, is really a, a kind of makes, will make a big difference between uh, I can write this in native Fortran or I can't, because it's a pretty major restructuring to take reductions out of your code. So that's expressing parallelism, and I would argue Fortran does a pretty good job already of being able to express parallelism. What about optimizing parallelism? So I have my same loop over here, um, and I've added now this vector clause. And I've here I'm just giving the compiler a hint that I want it to vectorize this loop, and I've chosen a vector length of 128. Um, and um, they don't read anything into this number, it's just an example here. Uh, but it is indicating to the compiler a particular aspect of parallelization that I want it to do. So I want this to be vectorized with a length of 128. That could be 32, it could be 1024, you know, whatever makes sense on the platform. And there's a lot of other clauses available. So OpenACC exposes three levels of parallelism. We call the outermost level gangs. Uh, we call the innermost level vectors. And then there's this middle intermediate level called workers. You can imagine, you know, workers in the gang. Um, and so these, the gang is very coarse grain and, and vectors are very fine grain. So I can actually give a lot of information about how I want this decomposed. And if I know I'm absolutely going to be running on a particular GPU or a particular uh, multi-core CPU, then I could take a lot of control from the compiler if I want to really optimize what's done. And then a few other things here. There are, there's a, a clause for collapsing, which um, ex exposes more parallelism to the compiler, and tiling, which exposes more locality. So uh, there's not a direct analog to this in Fortran, but I would say that there's a lot of restructuring you can do in Fortran that, uh, and with, via compiler flags or rewriting your loops to expose a lot of these same optimizations. So it can be done, but Anytime you're doing optimizations like this, you run the risk of optimizing for one platform at the expense of all of the others. So that's uh, optimizing uh, parallelism. Now, what about managing compute locality? So same loop on the left. And what I've added this time is a way of instructing the compiler where I want this to be run. And I can and tell the compiler, I know I'm going to have an NVIDIA device in the machine, and I want you to run on the first NVIDIA device, your device number zero. Um, and so I've directed it where the execution should go. And there is kind of an implicit here um, copying of the data to that device if necessary. And I could actually be very explicit about that. Um, and so uh, this provides me means that if I have uh, many GPUs on my machine, I can send some of my work to one and some of my work to the other, um, and I can fully manage where, uh, where I'm executing. Um, I haven't shown this, um, the self clause here. It's a feature we added at OpenACC 3.0, which came out last November. Um, but it's a way of saying, I want, I want to force this execution to run in parallel where I currently am versus offloading to somewhere else. So there's a lot of control here. Um, I can take control or I can leave it up to the runtime, and most users actually do leave it up to the runtime to decide. But as uh, we've got um, bigger nodes to, to work with, sometimes um, it's beneficial to take more control. Uh, particularly uh, if I have multiple devices, I may want to run on multiple devices simultaneously, which will require the asynchronous feature I'll talk about in a moment. And then there's 
managing data locality. So if I manage my compute locality, it's only going to run so well if my data is not located in the same space. And typically on a uh, heterogeneous machine with different types of processors, um, CPUs, GPUs, or FPGAs, I will need to, in some way, move my data from where um, I'm currently running to where I'm going to run uh, the loop. So we have uh, directives for this as well. Uh, we have here I'm saying uh, A and B are input arrays and C is an output array. And so uh, it will copy for the, for the extent of this from ACC data to ACC end data, uh, my data will reside on whatever device I'm going to be executing. And this looks really unexciting right here, but if you can manage, if you can imagine you know, tens of thousands of lines of code and loops in individual subroutines spread across lots of subroutines, uh, I may have my data region way up high in the main program and my loops in all of my subroutines. And leaving data out on the device as long as possible is really critical to getting good performance. And so this is, uh, this is a feature for um, once I've accelerated a bunch of loops, I'll then go back and add data regions to uh, eliminate data transfers. And there's, this is such an important challenge, and Will made a reference to this yesterday, that often managing the data is more important than managing the parallelism. And so we have lots of directives for that. Here is what we would call a structured data region because it has a defined beginning and end. They're all within the same scope. Um, but sometimes uh, its data lifetimes are not so neat. And you may begin the data lifetime in one subroutine and end it somewhere else. This is really typical in C++ where you may uh, allocate your memory in a constructor and deallocate it in a destructor. And that was really the, the important feature for that. But I've seen it a lot in Fortran codes as well. Uh, the update directive, I said this data, these data regions may exist way up in the main program. So Periodically, I may need to snapshot to disk, for instance, and I don't want to end my data lifetime because it's expensive to deallocate data from the device and then reallocate it later. So the update directive lets me uh, bring my, my CPU and GPU or CPU and accelerator in sync. Uh, deep copy, if you can iman imagine derived types of arrays of further derived types with pointers to other derived types, these complex data structures, uh, deep copy is the way of, of managing things that are more complex than just a simple flat Fortran array. Uh, device data interoperability. Um, if I am doing um, a, a FFT or a, a linear algebra um, problem, I may want to take the data that I've computed inside of my OpenACC code and pass it off to an optimized GPU library. And so we have interoperability there. And then also the cache directive. So I might want to tell the compiler, move a portion of this array to the fastest memory available on the device. So lots of information here about managing the locality of the data from, uh, from the, the big picture of it's running on this processor or that processor all the way down to the, the, the fine grain, put it in the closest possible memory. So uh, identifying the data structures that are important reducing the data movement, and giving the compiler additional context. Now, the, the copy in and copy out are in some ways similar to the intent on a, uh, on a Fortran subroutine. It, 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 it gives the compiler more information, but it can be very important when it involves moving data between distinct processors. Now, a little bit more about data locality because I want to argue that for a significant portion of the user base, Data locality may be a solved problem because modern GPUs uh, are able to take advantage of a unified view into memory. So traditionally, this picture of the top right is what we would look at where you have, I'm showing one CPU and one GPU and each has their own distinct memories. The CPU memory tends to be very large. The GPU memory tends to be very fast and I need to copy my data between them and that, you know, that arrow between them is not accidentally so thin. That tends to be the bottleneck. On a mod very modern GPUs, and this has been happening over the past, uh, say, five years or so, that more and more uh, work has gone into this, they can have a single pointer 
that uh, is can be dereferenced by either the CPU or GPU. And then the physical page backing that uh, can be migrated. And we started off with the GPU could page fault memory from the CPU. And then we later added the ability to page fault memory back to the CPU. And so now uh, you can have you know, one data allocation and it will migrate by the OS automatically. Locality in that case really matters because wherever I touch it, if it's going to migrate to the other memory, I want to operate on it as much as possible. Just like uh, you know, tiling your matrix multiplication, uh, operating on things as much as possible in the cache is good performance. Here, you can kind of view the GPU memory as a cache for that data. You want to operate on as much as possible. So locality really matters in this case. Um, but ubiquity matters. We need this to be available to all developers uh, and all memories. So currently, um, the, the, the unified virtual memory you would see on an NVIDIA platform, um, it, with the exception of the IBM Power platforms, um, is limited to dynamically allocated memory. Well, we want to be able to support stack memory. We want uh, every device's memory all the CPU's memory, all the GPU's memories to just be one large pool that's universally accessible. And so we've been working with the Linux kernel community to put a patch in called the Heterogeneous Memory Manager. And this is a way that basically, and if I were to call a standard allocate statement, or I would just put something uh, into, into stack memory, it's available everywhere. And when that becomes available and, and wide, you know, widespread, well, that will mean that any system, any memory, any type of device can just have one view into memory, and that's going to be really enabling. Now, there's always been a question of, well, if we're relying on page faulting, my data inherently is going to arrive just too late. So uh, am I going to get good enough performance? And so we did an experiment, and I stole this slide out of another presentation, but we, we took the spec Excel benchmark suite, which has, uh, this looks like you know 15 or so uh, benchmarks. The gray bars are the reference. That's fully optimized data movement. So that's the 100%. And then we took out the data, uh, the data movement and just relied on the operating system. And what you see is for the bulk of these codes, you can get 90 to 95% of the performance just out of the box without having to worry about it because, well, they've already been written with a pretty high degree of data locality, so it just works. There are exceptions, SWIM here is the, the most notable exception, but for many applications, this may be good enough. The convenience of simply being able to rely on the data being there may be good enough. And so uh, this is potentially already a solved problem. So that leaves the last concern that I wanted to address, uh, which is asynchronous execution. So here I have, um, I can expose the dependency between uh, my parallel loop and the, the data that it, it, the input data it needs and the output data it produces. And this can all be launched asynchronously. And so I can launch some work on one device, launch some work on another device, keep the CPU busy doing something else and really maximize the use of every aspect of my machine. Uh, and so uh, in talking to a lot of the, the Fortran OpenAC developers, many of them really rely on this to get just the absolute maximum um, uh, performance. So it's a way of exposing the dependence or lack of between regions. It uh, gives the potential for overlapping. So if I have two regions here, all, all of these uh, rely on each other because I've said async one. So I'm using Q number one. If I had something with an async two, it could run independently of these. And so we could actually have multiple things running at once and increase system utilization. So uh, that's kind of the last piece there. So if I look at all of those, uh, I would say, okay, OpenAC, I've, I've argued, has solved all of these. Fortran largely has solved identifying data parallelism, optimizing parallelism. Maybe it's already good enough, or maybe there's still room for improvement. Managing data locality, maybe, maybe good enough, maybe room for improvement. And then asynchronous operations here and managing compute locality are potentially uh, problems still to be solved. So I'm hoping to use the last few minutes here to show a real world example and then leave you with kind of my, my challenge to the, to the audience. Uh, Cloverleaf is a mini app developed by the Atomic Weapons Establishment in the UK. It's about 6,500 lines of Fortran. And what's great about this mini app is it's been ported to 
every parallel programming model known to man. And so we can compare lots of different programming models together. And source is available on GitHub at that link. And so here is the OpenACC version of the code. Um, this uh, one loop, uh, well, doubly nested loop here is a representative loop. Uh, um, in this case, it does not have a reduction. There are a few with reductions that we had to work through. Um, but uh, here I've specified um, create uh, parallelism at line 75 through line 107. And I've given the compiler information that these loops are safe to run. Uh, and here are the variables you need to privatize. And on the left is the feedback from the Portland Group compiler. This is NVIDIA's uh, comp uh, comp HPC compiler. It actually, uh, starting very soon, you'll see NV Fortran instead of PG Fortran. And what we see here is the compiler analyzed lines loop 77, 99, and decided these can be parallelized. And this thing down here where it says accelerator kernel generated, it created something for my GPU. And if you really want to dig in, it even tells you how it decomposed the parallelism. We took this same code, we stripped out the OpenACC, replaced it with do concurrent, and it looks like this. Uh, so now we're doing it with native Fortran. Um, now this is a, an, in, an internal development compiler. We've not productized this yet, but we've built it with our development compiler. No OpenACC directives at all. We are relying on that unified memory I just talked about. And you can see it once again, it generated GPU code. So right away, hey, this is good news. I'm able to, to take away some of these, uh, what Will yesterday said were Band-Aids, these directives, and just write uh, Fortran. And how did it perform? Uh, so some explanation here, the bright green bars are all using NVIDIA's uh, PGI compiler. Um, the, um, the first two pairs are comparing uh, OpenACC on, uh, OpenACC on running on the CPU versus OpenMP running on the CPU. So using, here's on Skylake, using the Intel compiler. Here is on AMD Rome, again, using the Intel compiler. So you can see uh, the code performs just as well as the OpenMP code. And we did the same thing on Power using uh, IBM's Excel compiler. But no code changes at all. We could take the same code and run it on a GPU. And it runs, here you're seeing about 4x faster on the GPU. And that's the bright green bar. But using our dev compiler with no open ACC at all, we were actually able to get that good a performance as well. Now, there are some caveats here. We had to work around the lack of reduction and a few other things. But on the whole, we could write the bulk of this code with standard Fortran. So this is not a productized compiler yet, but this is a, a, a proof of concept demonstrating that you know, what, uh, what's provided in Fortran is starting to become good enough for these parallel developers. So closing, you know, our vision here for parallel programming in the future is we really would like to, uh, we, NVIDIA, would like to work with the standard language committees, and we have folks working on the C++ and Fortran committees on making these languages support uh, parallelism better. We're also working within the directive communities of OpenACC and OpenMP to augment the base languages as necessary, and then only when you need the maximum performance would you fall down to something like, uh, like CUDA here, I'm showing CUDA Fortran, to maximize your performance here. And I've argued that perhaps data directives might not be needed anymore, so maybe, uh, maybe this is good enough, but I feel like there's still some places where directives uh, provide some value here. So for instance, asynchronous. So I don't think we're totally to a world yet with uh, a directive-free world, but I think we're, we're driving in the right direction. So I want to kind of put a challenge out to the committee and to uh, the community. Uh, first, you know, do concurrent. Um, is it ready for widespread use and is it enough? And, you know, we have some anecdotal evidence here that you can get a lot of, uh, a lot of what you need using just do concurrent. Uh, we do need that reduction clause to, to come in. And I know um, it's being worked on and it's expected in the next version. So that's going to be great. Um, co-arrays, I've left co-arrays out altogether. And we really kind of need to understand how do they fit into this picture? Um, and uh, we have lots of ideas. So if, if you have ideas, please reach out because we want to discuss this within the OpenAC committee. Oh, uh, what other gaps need filling? Uh, what are the common challenges between the Fortran language and the, the OpenAC community? And, and lastly, how can our communities work more closely together? Um, I'm, as I said, I'm now the chairperson of the OpenAC committee, and I'm really uh, beginning to familiarize myself a little more with the Fortran committee. And I really want to work with, with folks to, um, to try to drive these 
both forward. So I invite you to, to email us at feedback at openacc.org. And with that, um, thank you for your attention and, I, and I'm willing to take any questions. Thank you very much, Jeff, for this nice overview of, of uh, OpenACC. Um, we are running a bit behind. Therefore, one quick question, OpenMP. Sure. How do you see OpenACC and OpenMP? Competition? Uh, so, you know, as a developer and, and a full disclosure, I, I operate on both committees. Uh, uh, as a programmer, I see them as, um, as both good options. You can write good parallel code with Fortran. OpenACC has a little different level of uh, abstraction. It's a higher level of abstraction. It expects more from the compiler and less from the programmer. Whereas OpenMP, I would argue, off, uh, requires a little more from the programmer, a little less from the compiler. Um, they're both great, and I'm happy to discuss that further in, in the Slack. I'll, I'll hop in the Slack and, and answer further questions there. That would be really great. Thank you very much. Thanks.